continuing reading a letter to Mrs. Roosevelt. We're reading chapter five through eight. Chapter five, The Search. By the time I got home, my heart felt as if it would pop right out of my chest. Papa met me at the front door. The words were caught in the back of my throat. I was afraid to hear myself say them. I, I can't find him, Papa. Nobody's seen Charlie since Mr. Frappeth's store. He was there after school, then left. I glanced at Mr. Deluso, who was shaking her head and beating at her chest with a clenched fist. Il diavolo again. The gypsies have your Charlie. Stay, Zito, keep quiet. Papa's dark brown eyes were like daggers. Dead silence followed. My pep papa never talked to mama like that. People loved my papa. He helped everyone. The farmers always went into the shoe shop to see papa. He would fix their shoes even if they didn't have any money. They would trade a basket of fruit and vegetables for a pair of heels. Papa would bring the basket home and what mama didn't use we gave to the neighbors. Everybody loved my papa. He never talked like that to, like that to anyone. Mama's eyes filled with tears. I wasn't sure if she was embarrassed by Papa's outburst or if she believed Mrs. Deluso. Margo, think hard, said Papa in a much gentler tone. Why would Charlie not come home? Where could he be? It's your watch, Papa. He didn't return it to the drawer. He had it when I saw him, but that was on our way home from school. Papa, what if one of the gypsies saw Charlie with the gold watch? Charlie would never let anyone take it away from him. He knows what that watch means to you. What if the gypsies took Charlie and the watch? They steal chickens and children. Everybody knows that. I looked at Mrs. Deluso, certain that she would agree. Her head was down and her eyes were closed. Was she praying or was she expecting Papa to yell again? I heard those rumors in the shop today, said Papa. Officer Franks stopped in to pick up his shoes. The only report of anything missing is a crate of chickens that fell off the back of a farmer's truck on his way in from Somerset County. Mrs. Deluso looked straight at Papa. Ah, so we still have missing chickens, a missing boy, and now a missing watch. Three. Bad luck comes in threes. Papa's hands were clenched at his sides. He looked at Mama, shook his head, and said, I will find Charlie. He was out the front door before we could say another word. I caught up with Papa as he knocked on Rosa's door and asked for her father. Mr. Meglio helped Papa round up the other neighbors, and they went looking for my brother. Rosa was at my side. Maple Avenue echoed with shouts of Charlie, Charlie Bendini. It looked like a neighborhood game of hide and seek with everybody searching and calling his name. Charlie was the best at hiding. I just hoped he'd shout face real soon. It was getting dark. Chapter six, under the bridge. This time Rosa helped me search all the areas of Maple Avenue where Charlie played. As before, nobody had seen him. We went to the loading dock at the Acme Bakery. The boys sometimes went there at closing. The damaged goods were left in a bin for the hobos getting off trains near the brickyard. Charlie was not permitted on the dock. Just last week, Rosa and I had caught Michael and Charlie eating crushed cinnamon rolls in an alley next to the bakery. If I hadn't been so worried, I'd have stopped looking to tell Mama and Papa that story, too. Maybe, just maybe, I would. The search continued in the field and parking lot behind St. Anthony's. It was getting too difficult to see anyone or anything. I felt better with Rosa at my side. We joined the search in the alleyway behind my house. Lining the alley on the other side was a row of empty lots. It suddenly dawned on me that nobody had checked along the steep bank of the river past the lots. Charlie was not permitted there either. The river's strong current would suck in a kid like milk in a straw. I walked to the edge of the lots and looked down. I squinted and tried to see beyond the dark shadows of the steep bank. Rosa, I think I know where Charlie might be. My voice remained calm, but fear rushed through me, moving as swiftly as the water I heard below. I'm not allowed down there, and neither are you, Margot. It's too dangerous. What if you lose your footing and fall in the river? Rosa, you're always asking what if. Well, here's a what if for you. What if my brother lost his footing and is lying down there all alone? No sooner were the words out of my mouth than I knew I had hurt Rosa's feelings. I watched her run back to the dark alley. I closed my eyes. The darkness was all around me. I could feel it touching my skin. I knew that if I waited much longer, it would cover Charlie like a blanket. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I could remember the picture of President and Mrs. Roosevelt in the newspaper. Miss Dobson had brought it to school. Those were the very words Franklin Delano Roosevelt had said on the day of his inauguration. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. 
I could picture the words printed across Mr. Frappa's board. Under it, he had written FDR, March 4th, 1933. Mr. Frappa told, us, told all us kids to remember those words and to use them wisely. He said they might come in handy someday. Someday had come for me. It was here and now. I opened my eyes and looked into the endless dark. I could see the silhouette of the bridge. Under it was the glow of a small fire. I started down the steep bank. I didn't want to think about the weeds reaching up like prickly fingers around my knees. I focused my attention on the small fire. The cricket seemed to call out, go back, go back. I stopped. I should never have yelled at Rosa. She would know what to do. I could hear the water. The edge of the river must be very close. I decided to stay farther up along the bank and continue toward the bridge. My feet kept sliding on the weeds and rocks. Stones broke loose under my feet and rolled down the bank into the water. Beads of sweat rolled down my forehead and into my eyes. I wondered if President Roosevelt had ever gone hunting for a little brother in the pitch black. Charlie! Charlie! Come on, Charlie! I know you're under there. I was a stone's throw from the bridge. I could see the small campfire clearly. Everybody's looking for you. Papa won't be mad about the watch. He just wants you home. I edged closer. I could smell something cooking in a tin can sitting in the flames. He ain't here, missy. I heard a gruff voice and caught a glimpse of a tall, bearded man standing in the shadow of the fire. Gypsies! I screamed at the top of my lungs and ran. The bank of the river was steeper than I had realized. My hands and legs were bloody and bruised as I stumbled on the rocks and grabbed at the weeds, pulling myself up the steep slope. I could hear someone running. He was behind me, chasing me, reaching out to grab me. Was this what he'd done to Charlie? A loud scream rang in my ears. My scream. An arm reached out and pulled me to the top of the bank. Papa, I... Everything went blank as I collapsed into his arms. Chapter 7. The Pocket Watch. I could hear Mama's voice calling me. Margo! Margo! Wake up, Margo! I opened my eyes to a room full of people staring down at me. I was on the parlor couch and Papa was kneeling at my side. Mama patted, patted a cool, damp cloth against my forehead. I sat up so fast the cloth in Mama's hand went flying. Papa, I know the gypsies have Charlie, I blurted out. A man was chasing me, trying to take me away, too. Margo, calm down. That man was only trying to reach you to hold on to you. He was afraid you'd fall and land in the river. Now, your mama and I are grateful for his help, and you need to thank him. Papa ran his hand through the, his dark, wavy hair and stood up. His height and his stern voice made me feel small and silly for what I'd thought and said. A bearded man stood inside our front door, shifting his weight from foot to foot as though he was afraid to move. He held his cap in one hand and waved to me with the other. Papa called him over. Missy, the stranger said in the same gruff voice I'd heard earlier, you sure did give me a fright. I think you scared me as much as I scared you. I thought for sure you'd fall back into that river. I ain't never seen nobody climb a riverbank that fast. I wasn't chasing you. I was trying to catch you, but I ain't seen your Charlie, and I sure ain't seen no gypsies. I've been under that bridge for two days, waiting to catch the eastbound train. I hear there might be work in the apple orchards in New York State. I sure am sorry if I scared you, Missy. A deep groan escaped from my lips. I closed my eyes as tightly as I could. I could feel the heat rising inside me. I felt like such a fool. It was useless to try and hide my beet red burning ears. Like the flashing red light on the train tower, my ears were a signal to everybody, letting them know just how embarrassed I was. I looked up at the man standing next to Papa, his eyes locked with mine, and in that split second, it felt as if I could see straight into his heart. I wondered if Charlie, wherever he might be, was feeling like this man, lonely. I'm sorry, too, I said. I should never have gone down there in the dark. Thanks for your help. You should also thank Rosa. She came to get me. Papa turned to Mama and added, we've searched everywhere for Charlie. I suddenly felt very tired. I looked at Mama. Her chestnut brown hair had been neatly pulled back in a Shannon earlier, Shannon earlier today. Now strands of her hair had escaped the pins and were hanging in curls around her face and neck. Her brown eyes had lost their usual twinkle and looked like dark, empty pools. People always told me I looked exactly like my mother. I wondered if I looked like her right now. Rosa, please help Margot go upstairs. Mama looked at Mrs. Meglio, who nodded in agreement. Rosa, I'm sorry about what I said earlier, I whispered as we climbed the steps to the second floor. If I had listened to you, they might have found Charlie by now and not wasted time on me. I turned to look at Mama one last time. She usually blew Charlie and me a kiss from the bottom step when we went to bed. 
Instead, she was standing at the front door, handing the man with the beard a loaf of bread she had baked yesterday. It was the first time a hobo had ever come to our front door. They always came to the back door. He would have scared me too, Margo. Rosa always seemed to be able to read my mind. Pop always says the hobos like to work for the food given them. I hope Mama gave him some fruit with a loaf of that bread. He sure did earn it. Rosa went into my bedroom while I washed up in the bathroom. When I returned to my room, she was sitting as straight as a rod on my bed. She put a finger to her lips, motioning to me to be quiet. With the other hand, she pointed to the floor under my bed. I stood still. We could hear a slow, deep, vibrating snore in and a soft, steady, long breath out. There's only one person I know who can fall asleep just about anywhere and snore and snore his way through anything. I knelt down next to my bed and yanked Rosa to her knees. Together, we lifted the skirt of the bedspread and together we shouted, Charlie Bandini! A herd of feet came running up the stairs. Papa was the first one into my room and down on his knees. He pulled my brother out from under the bed and onto his feet. What's all the racket for? Charlie looked at Mama and all the people standing in my room. He was rubbing his eyes as though a good night's sleep had been stolen from him. Papa hugged Charlie tightly, then shook him. Then he hugged him again as if to make certain it was really Charlie. Amid all the chatter and confusion, Charlie leaned over and asked me, What took you so long? I just shook my head and stared. And then there it was again, like the flashing red light on the train tower. But this time it was Charlie's ears that were burning. He looked at all the faces staring at him, then broke the silence. Papa and Mama, I'm sorry. I heard everybody calling me, but I knew I'd be in trouble, so I was hiding up here, waiting for Margot. I thought she'd help me, but she never came up. I guess I fell asleep. Mama pulled Charlie to her side. In trouble for what, Charlie? Help you with what, Charlie? Charlie knelt down on his good knee and reached under the bed. This, he said as he pulled out a small box. It was filled with tiny golden pieces spread from edge to edge. In the middle of the box was the case of Papa's gold watch, opened and empty. I dropped it on the sidewalk when Michael and I were walking home from school. It stopped working, Papa. The burning redness of Charlie's ears spread across his face. His eyes brimmed with tears. I borrowed a tiny screwdriver from Mr. Frappa. I, I thought I could f f fix it. Chapter 8. The Lady I woke to the clanging bell of the trolley car going down Maple Avenue. Saturday was well underway by the time I kissed Mama good morning. She had already been to Frappa's store to buy lard and had gone to the farmer's truck in the alley behind St. Anthony's Church. The farmer and his wife came once a week to sell fresh eggs, butter, and produce. I often went with Mama to help her carry everything, but today it was a relief to know I wouldn't have to face the neighborhood first thing in the morning. Saturday was usually the day Charlie spent with his pal Frankie from the or orphanage. Frankie was one of the older boys and was often set on errands in town. Charlie would go with him, and the nuns would give Frankie some extra free time. He and Charlie liked to spend it at the bridge, helping Mr. Bob operate the gate when the trains passed by. I saw Frankie headed into town by himself this morning. Late last night, after everybody had left our house, Mama and Papa talked to Charlie and me. They decided Charlie would go to work with Papa every Saturday. I wasn't sure if that was meant to be a punishment for Charlie. He already had his own shoe shine kit and shoe stand in Papa's shop and could rip the old heels and soles off the steel workers' boots. Mama and Papa were more relieved than angry about last night's ordeal, but they did let Charlie and me know that we had to be more responsible. Papa told me I was lucky to have learned such a valuable lesson at a young age. Margot, rumors are very dangerous. They are like weeds in a garden. If they are not stopped, they will grow and grow until they choke out everything else. Our neighbors were scared last night. They might have gotten angry, too. What if they had listened to you and gone after some gypsies or after that hobo? I knew my ears were burning red again. I could only think, better my ears than my behind. Somehow, Lola Nola came to mind. I had heard that her father used a belt to teach a lesson. I wondered if that was a rumor, too. Rumor or not, Papa's stern words did not feel so harsh after all. The day passed by quickly. Rosa came over. We sat in my room, sorting through the postcards. The newest addition to my collection was the card Mr. Frappa had given me. I stared at it and wondered if I would ever get to see the Empire State Building. We made up stories about the pictures. Most of the postcards were old and had been sent to Mama and Papa before the Depression. Now our friends and relatives spent the little money they had on food and bills. 
Nobody we knew traveled very far. Not anymore. When we grew tired of the postcards, we pretended that we were Eleanor everywhere, the president's wife, visiting faraway places. Miss Dobson had told us she earned that nickname because she traveled everywhere for President Roosevelt. She had become his eyes and ears ever since he had been struck with polio. Eleanor Roosevelt visited people and places all across the country to see how they were doing, then took the information back to the president. He decided how to help them. Rosa and I hoped Eleanor Roosevelt would come to Johnstown someday. Maybe she could help the people who worked in the steel mill. Then Rosa wouldn't have to move. Rosa was carrying on, pretending she was Eleanor everywhere, speaking at the Chicago World's Fair. The sound of a far-off train whistle caught my attention. Shh, Rosa, it's coming. We had just enough time to tuck the postcard collection away in the trunk under my window. We closed the heavy lid and scrambled onto its top. I opened the window facing Mabel Avenue and pulled Rosa to my side. Okay, said Rosa. I say seven cars and the lady is seated in the middle of the fourth car wearing her gray hat. I elbowed Rosa and said, there are always seven cars and she always wears her gray hat and she always sits in the middle of the fourth car when she's on the train. Rosa and I waited for the Saturday night excursion train every week. It took people from Johnstown to New York City. A second whistle echoed between the twin hillsides. I could hear the slow, steady clickety-clack, clickety-clack as the train snaked its way through town. Rosa shouted, there it is, just as the train appeared on the trestle near the brickyard. The lights stayed on in the passenger cars, and the train would not gain speed until it passed the Acme Bakery. We had just enough time to catch a glimpse of the passengers. Together, we counted engine one, two, three, four. There she is. The lady with the gray hat was on the train every other Saturday. We couldn't see her face. She had light-colored hair, and she always tilted her gray hat in such a way that we couldn't even see her profile. Well, I think she's off to see a Broadway show. She will then meet a wealthy man, get married, and never come back, I said. You silly, Rosa laughed. If she can afford to go on that train, then she already is wealthy. Okay, I said. Then she's a spy and has her hat pulled down so we can't see who she is. I don't think a spy would be all dressed up and headed out of town on an excursion train twice a month, said Rosa. The train whistle sounded one last time as it picked up speed and disappeared into the darkness. I knew our game of make-believe was over when we heard shouting come from Rosa's house. Margo, do you ever think about what you, would what you would take if you had to leave your home? What if the sheriff posted a sign on your front door and forced you to leave? What would you take? I looked at Rosa. Her eyes had tears in them, which told me she wanted more than a make-believe answer. I would take as many clothes as I could carry, some soap and my toothbrush, my postcard collections, and you. Rosa gave me half a smile, sniffed to stop her nose from dripping, then sighed. Our eyes met, and I smiled. I wanted her to know that nothing could ever separate us. Well, I didn't think so until the shouting at Rosa's house grew into loud screams. Rosa's eyes grew wide and watery again. I'd better go, she said. She ran out of my room and down the steps. The screen door slammed behind her. I sat at the window facing her porch. I was beginning to wonder if it was the darkness or something else out there that I was afraid of.